Hi, this is Jeff Thigpen, Guilford County Register of Deeds. And I'm Carly Malcolm, lead for North Carolina Fellow for Guilford County from the UNC School of Government. And welcome to the Good Grief Podcast. Have you ever lost a loved one and had to figure out what to do? Have you ever felt alone and overwhelmed? Did it make you wonder why on earth this is all so complicated? In this podcast series, we bring together community partners to talk unapologetically about issues of death and dying. We answer questions about funerals, hospice, estates, and more to give our listeners the knowledge they need to make decisions for themselves and their loved ones. We want everyone in Guilford County to know that they're supported, that we live in a community where we cannot only live and live well, but when we die, we can also die well because we care. So we thank you for joining us for the Good Grief Podcast and for taking this step to be better prepared for end-of-life challenges. This is Jeff Thigpen, Guilford County Register of Deeds with Carly Malcolm, Lead for NC Fellow from the North Carolina Institute of Government, and welcome to the Good Grief Podcast. Today we're going to talk about elder care and estate planning with attorney Dennis Toman a certified elder law, elder law attorney at the elder law firm in Greensboro, North Carolina. Born on the plains of North Dakota, Dennis uh, had a big family, and uh, he learned the meaning of hard work, uh, being frugal, and planning ahead. After attending law school in North Carolina, Dennis founded the Elder Law Firm with a mission of planning and helping local families be better prepared for elder care and other legal issues uh, on the backside of their lives. Um, Dennis, thank you for being with us. Oh, it's my pleasure. I'm very happy to be here. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Dennis, why did you choose, um, after going to law school, to specialize in elder care law? Well, that's a a question I think about a lot myself. Um, (laughs) I don't think I ever planned to actually start and do elder care law. I always thought I'd come out and be a, a corporate attorney. I went, got an accounting degree and, you know, came out of law school, planned to be a corporate attorney. In fact, that's what I did for, for quite a while. Um, but I had the opportunity to help some families who were facing uh, problems with, you know, finding care, paying for care, how to make sure that, that uh, you know, with the spouse in the nursing home, they didn't lose their house. And I was fortunate to help them. Um, they really appreciated it. I enjoyed doing it. And really comes down to family. Um, this is a wonderful way to be able to help people who are concerned about their family and making sure things turn out better. Hmm. What does a typical day in the life look like for an elder law attorney? Well, for my office and what we do, we really take more of a planning aspect. And so we don't spend much time in court. Uh, In fact, our goal is to keep people out of court. Um, You know, we're talking with families who are at various stages along the estate planning elder care journey um, continuum. And so uh, we, we talk about what's important to the people who have concerns. Who maybe there's something that's keeping them up at night. They're worried about what's going to happen uh, as part of if they were to become disabled or their loved one was to become disabled and unable to make decisions. You know, they worry about the probate process or perhaps they've lost a loved one recently. We need to think about how to administer an estate. So we spend a lot of time talking with families to consider what they're worried about consider what some of the possibilities would be for them to proceed and to implement good plans and keep them heading in the right direction, you know, for whatever life throws at them. Mm. So what are some of the most important questions that proper estate planning would answer? Well, when, when we're talking with our clients, you know, there's really three questions that we always want to make sure that we answer and that they feel comfortable that they have answered. And the first one is the one that quite often people will come in, and, and that's that's what they think about for estate planning, and that is what happens if they die, what happens if a loved one dies, what's going to be the process of making sure property transfers to the right people, you know, what can be done to perhaps avoid some of the probate process and the court-administered uh, estate administration. So what happens if a person dies is, is one critical question. But then really the question that I think um, winds up being even more important is what happens if a person doesn't die, but instead they're going to need care. How are we going to get that care? Where is that care going to be received? How are they going to pay for that care, hopefully without having to go broke? So, you know, what happens if they don't die, but they need care? 
Mm-hmm. And then that third question, which oftentimes I don't get asked, but I bring up, and once I bring it up, it becomes just a sigh of relief that, yes, this has been a concern. And that is, what happens if they don't die, but they get Alzheimer's, and they aren't able to make their own decisions, or perhaps they have a stroke where they're not able to make their own decisions or an accident or injury. And in that situation, having the right decision makers in place to make sure that their wishes are carried out, that the people that they know and trust and love are going to be the ones who are making those decisions for them, and that the documents that we put into place can wrap around and protect them in the way that it needs to be that perhaps typical estate planning might not do. So you mentioned documents. Um, what estate planning documents do you think that uh, people should have? Well, there, there's some basic um, pieces to this, and that's where you start, and then maybe you go beyond that a little bit further, depending upon the situation. And, of course, most people that we're working with, we're not dealing with estate tax issues. So um, the concern is going to be you know, not directed at complex tax matters. So For most people, the situation that we're going to be looking at is, well, they need a will. Everybody needs a will, but they need to have more than a will. So somebody comes in and says, I've got my estate planning done because I've got my will. No, they really don't have their estate planning um, done. In fact, they're missing probably the most important parts. And that is, besides the will, pretty much everybody needs to have in place a good, solid, I call it a powerful power of attorney for financial and legal decision. And that's where I see too many people fall short. The other type of power of attorney that we need to have in place is what's called a healthcare power of attorney for someone to be able to make medical decisions in case the individual is unable to make or communicate their own decisions. So those three documents, will, healthcare power of attorney, financial power of attorney, critical, as well as having a living will that expresses wishes about what types of care um, should be provided if a person's not going to get better and they're not able to make their own decisions, as well as, and this is something that gets overlooked quite often, we want to have a HIPAA release or a medical privacy release in place because we don't want somebody to be in the emergency room with any question about the family members being able to talk to the health care providers because of the HIPAA laws. So we start with that, a will, financial power of attorney, health care power of attorney, HIPAA release, and a living will, which is a declaration of a desire for a natural death. And then quite often, depending upon you know the situation, what assets are there, the family matters, what the goals are, we'll implement some sort of trust-based planning, either a revocable trust or sometimes it's a protector trust to make sure we can put assets into a trust that provides additional protection for the family. Yeah, so you've mentioned about seven documents here dealing with uh, both the individual and also the financial issues to communicate one's desires, needs, and or to help protect the person or the families in terms of making these decisions. A lot of times, I, well, I deal a lot with land records, and we have sometimes people come in and say, yeah, I want to transfer land, and they go, do I really have to have an attorney? And sometimes it it is not necessarily the desire around, you know, they want to try to do it to get it done, but they may not get it totally right. And sometimes they want to save money. As an attorney who does this, what do you uh, see usually is is the cost factor involved in uh, proper estate planning? And do people need a lawyer's help? Can they do it themselves? You know, what are the the, maybe the benefits and consequences of of that question in terms of your uh, your perspective? Sure. Yeah. And I think that's, I mean, the, the, I think you, you bring up a good point, uh, Jeff, in that the, the first need is for people to see the need. Yeah. <laughs> um, they have to understand that, that something needs to be done. And then the next question is going to be, how are they going to get it done? And there are situations where, um, you know, very straightforward, perhaps not in much at, you know, that that's going to be at risk if there's a mistake made that somebody could get a will done perhaps with, uh, you know, by themselves or, you know, through an online service, uh, you know, very straightforward situations and save some money doing it that way. But the the real problems uh, arise, you know, in situations that aren't quite so straightforward. Unfortunately, everybody thinks their situation's 
simple. <laughs> yeah. um, they always think, um, you know, well, I don't have anything, you know, complicated, but the, I've been practicing law long enough to understand. I don't know all the answers, but I know a lot of the questions. Mm. And so the advantage to someone who has seen the need, we need to do something, get the right plan in place in working with an experienced um, estate planning elder care attorney is going to be they have the opportunity to, to say what they're worried about and to have that conversation about, well, this is, yeah, you're worried about that, but have you also considered this? And yeah. to, you know, say, okay, well, this is what you'd like to accomplish, but what if something a little bit different happens? Um, how are things going to work out then? So the real cost of, you know, not having the right proper estate planning can be enormous. You know, problems with family disputes, problems with estates getting tied up in court uh, because there's a mistake that was made on the will that somebody wrote up themselves and they left out something that was very critical or it wasn't clearly written and didn't have enough, you know, backup, uh, you know, alternative results if, if the first thing didn't happen, what was going to happen if, in the other situation. You know, problems that occur that if they're not thought through are just going to be devastating for the family. And, yeah. and so the costs involved, plus the fact that people don't get a second chance at this. So, you know, they go ahead and prepare their documents. Um, we help them with that. They're not written in stone. They can come back and change them. If life changes and they have, you know, want to change later, they certainly can. But the problem is when somebody loses the ability to sign their documents, if they become incapacitated, unable to make their own decisions, or if they died, we can't go back and change things. And so if they weren't done right that time, you know, then they've got a real problem on their hands. And that's what we want to make sure people get the appropriate help to get the right plan and documents in place for them. And that they can just then you know, go on living life and not keep worrying about, gee, did I do that right? Should I have done something different? Uh, you know, and just be able to, to have that peace of mind of saying, hey, this is taken care of. Now let's go ahead and, you know, not worry about it for a while. So people can, you know, you hear what these documents are and some people say, well, yeah, I think I could probably do this, whatever. But I'm telling you, I know there are going to be a lot of people listening to this. And uh, I just say it sure is beneficial to get the advice of an experienced attorney in dealing with these kinds of issues, because I know you all deal with this every day. You see the situations that come up and you can really do a good job helping families plan, individuals and families plan this in such a way that peace of mind in terms of getting that counsel can be extremely helpful. So, yeah, thank you. So you told us about the documents that the typical person would expect to need, but are there any special situations that might need some extra attention in terms of estate planning? Yeah, I think, um, you know, obviously one that's very um, common is when we've got blended families, when we've got um, second or third marriages and there's children from prior marriages. Those are going to be situations that we need to spend some extra time thinking about not only how does property pass, but also who's going to be in charge, who's going to be the decision makers and um, how's that going to work out? Because uh, blended families, you know, may be a very simple, um, you know, ready for everything just to go to, for example, the surviving spouse and then let them make the decisions. But sometimes that's not going to be the best result. Another special situation would be if we're dealing with um, a family who has a child with special need, and they're likely to be unable to work and take care of themselves and, and probably are going to need care over their lifetime, and most likely are going to require and be able to benefit from financial service through government programs such as Medicaid. So we've got a child with special needs, the parents can take action to make sure that the inheritance that they would leave for that child will not interfere with those government programs and also that the, the inheritance can be appropriately managed so that it can really benefit that child and improve their quality of life. That becomes absolutely critical in, in that regard. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, there's many other special situations, but the other one that I would mention is when we're dealing with a, a diagnosis of Alzheimer's or dementia. Because so often when someone has a diagnosis of Alzheimer's or dementia, they're perfectly able to make decisions on their own now. But 
the writing is on the wall that it's very likely that soon they won't be able to. Now, soon might be years from now, but it's critical for them to meet with, again, an experienced elder law estate planning attorney who can say, okay, these are the things we want to make sure we've got it put into place. And it may be that it's a caregiver spouse who's wanting to protect the ill spouse, the spouse with Alzheimer's. Just in case the caregiver spouse dies first, how are things going to turn out better for that surviving spouse? You know, we never want to see somebody out of money and out of options at one of the most frail and vulnerable times of their lives. And having the right plan put in place means we can protect that surviving spouse so that we don't have to worry about them running out of money and, you know, trying to live on um, what little bit they can, can keep after they're eligible for Medicaid. So, those are just some of the special situations, obviously, estate tax issues, um, charitable inclinations, planning to weave money for charity, you know, situations where children may be likely to go through, um, you know, marital problems, their own divorces, or even, you know, you know uh, might be sued, ways to protect that inheritance again for that child. Those are all special things that people need to consider as part of their plan, and all of a sudden they realize that, hey... You know, maybe this isn't just do a simple will and you're done, but there's more to it involved. And so that's, that becomes very important, too. Well, thank you for that. Could you describe the typical process of getting in place the right estate plan? Sure. The, again, I think you know, Jeff made the point um, of observation, and it was a good one. First, you know, there's the need, um, you know, need to go in and get estate planning done. And so that's all through life. And one of the things that people don't really understand is as soon as their child turns age 18, their child needs to have a power of attorney in place too. Because once the child is an adult, the parents can no longer make decisions for that child. And so without a proper power of attorney in place that the child has, maybe naming the parent as a decision maker, they're going to be um, left to the guardianship process, which they really want to try to avoid. In that situation, so my point is that, you know, the need, um, and the need is all through life for, you know, brand new, you know, 18 year old adult, a college student, a young, young person starting out in career, family, making sure that they got guardians named for their minor children, you know, all the way through, um, to when we're, we're dealing with, um, someone who may be in advanced years. But, Contacting the lawyer's office, you know, they're going to probably set up a time to have an initial conversation about what you want to accomplish, you know, what's important to you, what, what are the assets, income, health, family, goals, that sort of thing. So it's a matter of, you know, understanding the situation. I call it a vision meeting quite often to make sure that we've got the right idea of where we want to go. And at that point, um, typically the lawyer can provide a, a good estimate on what the uh, price is going to be for providing those services and get the right plan in place. And so many families do appreciate having a, the, you know, the fixed price, um, contract, which is, okay, this is the plan we're planning to do. This is how much it's going to cost. Now we're ready to go ahead and get started. The next part of it's probably going to be a design meeting to, you know, flesh out a little bit more some of the details, some of the intentions for how things will work out. And then based upon what the information that's been gathered, then do a signing meeting to go ahead and sign the documents, have them in place, probably get them scanned in so the person has not only the originals but a scan as well. And then an assistance um, with uh, funding and make sure that assets are titled properly that the right beneficiaries and our IRAs and life insurance and annuities, and if there is a living trust, how to go about retitling assets into that living trust. So it really is a process. It's also not just an event. It doesn't happen just once. I think it's important that people review their estate plan over a period of time. You know, so about every three years, every three to five years, we recommend that people do that again because, you know, families change, health changes, finance changes. You know, I tell our clients, sometimes I get smarter, too. So, you know, if I wait three years, I might know more three years from now. And uh, But it's just the, the critical thing is it's not just papers that go into a file or a notebook that gets put on the shelf, but it really ought to be revisited, like I said, every three to five years. Right. And one of the things that you mentioned in there was the concept of guardianship. When would it be appropriate for someone to appoint a legal guardian? 
Yeah, a guardian is going to be needed, of course, for a minor child who is going to own property. So sometimes, you know, particularly when when someone doesn't have a will and they pass on, then a child who's underage uh, is going to need to have a guardian appointed, and that's a court appointed uh, or court court supervised process of determining who's going to be the guardian. A person can name a guardian uh, for a minor child in their in their will, and so that's very important for younger families to make sure that they've accomplished, just in case neither parent is living. Another situation would be when someone not able to make decisions that are their own best interest. Uh, and so they can't, uh, they, they've reached a point where they're no longer competent to make their own decisions. In that situation, there's going to be a need for a guardian unless we've got the powers of attorney in place. And again, the guardianship itself is something that I encourage people to avoid whenever possible. Sometimes people come in and say, well, I need to appoint a guardian for my husband because he has Alzheimer's or, you know, my, my mom needs to have a guardian. Well, are there ways that we can avoid doing that? Are there documents in place already, or do they still have enough capacity to sign documents that could avoid that guardianship? And so if we're going to need to have a guardian, that's one thing. Many people think, well, I'm not going to need a guardian because my, my wife can make my decisions for me or my husband can make my decisions. And in fact, the way the laws in North Carolina work is that the law presumes that if you did not get around to preparing a power of attorney to name someone to make decisions for you if you became incompetent, if you did not do that, then the law presumes you presume you you meant not to do that. Mm. The, the presumption is that you didn't want to name a power of attorney. You wanted the guardianship. And so, again, the guardian is the default, but we prefer for people to have the powers of attorney so that uh, we can avoid that guardianship. Interesting. Yeah. Of course, we're living in a time of COVID and uh, there's there's been uh, a lot of impact related to nursing homes and things of that sort. What rights are protected for people who are living in nursing homes uh, in general? And how can someone uh, file a claim if they believe those rights are violated? Yeah, right now, especially is a tough time for both the people in the nursing homes as well as the caregivers there at the nursing home. And so it's a difficult decision to place a loved one into a nursing home under the under typical times. And these times, it's even harder because of the lack of access to the residents due to the COVID concerns. And, you know, in that regard, the number one thing is to try to have a relationship with the care team at the facility, the administrators, the CNAs, the nurses on the floor. That's always a good thing to do. And then there are um, North Carolina nursing home rights which are, you know, include a number of, of uh, provisions. Uh, and it's, you know, those are actually posted at each nursing home. And then if there are problems, I encourage uh, you know, families to first, again, talk with the administration at the facility. But an excellent resource here locally is that the, uh, the North Carolina Ombudsman, Long-Term Care Ombudsman Program is right over in Kernersville. And calling them, getting them involved with um, concerns over the level of care at a nursing home or assisted living is an excellent way to start and make sure that you have an advocate on your side to sort through things. And sometimes that can't get sorted through and has to be, you know, go to a next level. But that's a great way to start. Dennis, as registered deeds, I get questions all the time about families wanting to put their uh, children's names on the deeds and that kind of thing in terms of when they get in these situations where they're dealing with loved ones who are sick or, or dealing with death and dying. What, do you have a take on that? Yeah, that's a question we get asked all the time. And the answer is, of course, people want to protect their house, especially if they're going to need nursing home care down the road because there's Medicaid estate recovery, which can result in the house getting lost to the, the government um, if the person's in the nursing home and not Medicaid. And so in order to protect the house, lots of times they say, well, should I just put my house into my child's name? And the answer to that is be very, very careful before you do that. And the reason is that once a person puts a child's name onto the house, some unexpected things are going to happen. You know, number one, if you put your child's name onto the house, that means anything else that's going to be done from there on out is going to require their signature. And if they're married, their spouse's signature, too. Hmm. And so that, you know, don't make a gift to your child unless you'd also give it to your son-in-law or daughter-in-law, too. Mm. And the other is, of course, there's a five-year look back 
for Medicaid purposes that a person um, is going to be ineligible for a period of time if they need to apply for Medicaid within five years after they've made that gift. Plus, there's the other issue of taxes, which I've just seen too many horror stories happen where people have put their child's name onto their house thinking everything was going to be fine, and then they find out they created tax problems, they created family problems, something happens to the child, the child dies or becomes disabled or goes through a divorce, you know, life happens, and their child's name is on the, the house now, and the parents are the ones who wind up paying the price. There's much better ways of planning to protect the house than simply deeding the house over into the child's name. And usually that's going to involve um, some sort of a protector trust in planning ahead. Um, or if we're in a crisis situation, there are other strategies that we may want to employ. But we don't want to just put the house in the child's name unless we thoroughly considered that first. Well, thank you very much for answering that question, because now when folks come in my office and they ask, hey, uh, uh, should I do this? My answer is always, you may want to consult an attorney. <laughs> so, so thank you for offering that up because that's the reason why. All right. Well, thank you so much, Attorney Dennis Toman, who is a specialist certified in elder law with the Elder Law Firm in Greensboro, North Carolina. Uh, Dennis, on behalf of Carly and myself, we really appreciate you uh, coming in and spending some time with us, uh, well, by phone around issues of elder care, around estate planning, helping us understand all of these documents and why they're really important and the impact that they have on our lives and why it's so important to think about these things now. We like to talk about on the podcast that we, we know in many cases we live in a culture that, that has a hard time preparing for issues of serious illness and death and dying. And sometimes when we're not Doing this planning, it sneaks up on us and causes all kinds of problems. And as someone who is a part of that system in terms of the Register of Deeds, who works with the clerk's office and many other government institutions, there are attorneys like you who are out there who help members of our community navigate through not only uh, the issues of making sure this stuff is done right uh, and it reflects their wishes, um, but it's also the practical matters of, of trying to take care of things when uh, when people lose their loved ones. And so planning is so important. And thank you so much for taking the time to come in and talk with us on the Good Grief Podcast. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Good Grief Podcast. We want your feedback. You can visit our website at www.guilforddeeds.com. You can also email us at endoflife at guilfordcountync.gov or find us on Twitter with the handle at Guilford underscore R-O-D. We hope you've enjoyed this episode and until next time, take care.